Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you in our courtroom, and it's nice to be in our courtroom. Um, we are here this morning to hear one matter, In Re Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission for State Legislative and Congressional Districts Duty to Redraw Districts by November 1st, 2021. Um, in support of the petition, we have three advocates sharing time, Ms. Sherman, um, Ms. Pastula, and Ms. Meingeist, and you guys will manage that if that's okay with you, okay. Um, and you will proceed first. If you wanna try and reserve some time, you, you, may, you may try, um, and we can see how that goes. Um, and then we will um, go to you, Ms. Barranco, and Mr. Bursch, you, you will close us out if that works for everybody. I think that's how we're proceeding. If I've said anything wrong, just tell me. But, okay, uh, Ms. Sherman, you may proceed. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. Deputy Solicitor General Ann Sherman here on behalf of the Attorney General team supporting jurisdiction. With me at council table is Julianne Pastula representing the commission and Heather Meingas representing the secretary. During my five minutes, I'll try to help frame the issues and touch on the jurisdictional and mandatory versus directory points. Uh, I'll be followed by the commission arguing for 10 minutes and the secretary for five. Ms. Meingast would like to reserve two minutes of her time for rebuttal on behalf of the petitioners. Michigan's history shows that as far back as 1963, the people have wanted an independent redistricting commission. Uh, and with respect to that, the the, this court has asked three questions about redistricting and the redistricting amendments. This team, the commission, and the secretary are all in sync that the answers to those questions is yes. And that the most important thing here is protecting the redistricting process that the people enshrined in the Constitution. One of the things we know from Michigan's history, however, is that redistricting is complicated and time consuming. The people understood this, and that's why, based on their knowledge of when the federal census data was historically released and is historically released, they set timetables that would give the commission seven months to do its work, and the people seven months to have some meaningful input into that work. We're now faced with circumstances that are not the best. The commission's weighty, meaningful work is really clashing, and that, that work has to be supported by uh, census data as will describe the districts accurately uh, and verify their populations. That is clashing with the deadlines that the people thought would be reasonable. And now, meeting the deadlines will actually pre prejudice the very process that the people intended. It's important to understand that dilemma in answering this court's questions. On the jurisdictional question, section 619 is the most direct source of this court's uh, original jurisdiction. It mandates that this court direct the commission and the secretary to perform their respective duties. Now that language is not nearly as wooden and limiting as the team opposing jurisdiction and the Senate suggest. It is broad enough to empower this court to guide these petitioners in figuring out which duties to perform when they can't perform all of their duties. And at least with respect to a timing requirement, that language contemplates that this court's guidance will be anticipatory because it makes no sense for this court to, to, to direct the petitioners to, uh, to, to have a deadline that they've already missed, to meet a deadline they've missed. On the mandatory versus jurisdictional question, this court has the authority to deem a timing requirement, a constitutional timing requirement directory, and it's done so in the past in the Ferency case. It can do so again, whereas here, the issue that's at stake is very important, the people's direct legislative voice, and where the petitioners have done everything they can to try to meet that deadline. Those were the two key factors that drove the result in Ferency. Now, the fact that se Section 6-7, um, that November deadline, that, that language says 
uh, uses the word shall, and despite that, that November deadline is not sub uh, substantive. It's really designed to be an administrative tool, a means to an end that will implement this important process and the people's involvement in the process, not to upend the process. And I would but, also uh, add- Ms. Chairman, if you are all in sync, who are the adverse parties before the court in this case, in this original action? This court doesn't need uh, an adverse party. The people spoke through section 619, and the people said in 619, uh, when they gave this court jurisdiction, they didn't require that there be any adversity. If that expanded our power to issue advisory opinions, doesn't that call into question the constitutionality of the entire redistricting scheme? Because there was no language in the amendment that said that it was abrogating or revising the advisory opinion a section of the Constitution. That's a, quite a bold statement, isn't it? The language of the Constitution trumps, and this, this is more specific language than any general language even in the Constitution, and this particular language gives this court the ability to hear questions just like this, even in the absence of adversity, and that constitutional, that specific constitutional language trumps. So, you, so, you, so you're asking us for an advisory opinion without adverse parties. What about the, the actual controversy requirement? What's the controversy here? Well, the people in Section 619 didn't require that there be any advers, uh, adversary party. And as a result of that, this court can hear this even in the absence of adversity. And that's but really I, I moved, underscored. I moved, I've heard your answer there. I moved on to the controversy. Does there have to be a controversy or we don't need that either? Well, there's clearly a controversy here. Uh, what the, is it? The controversy is whether these deadlines can be met, whether the petitioners can meet their deadlines, and whether the people can preserve for themselves their direct legislative voice as they express through the redistricting amendments. And I would also point out that- Are we, are that, we in a situation where the deadlines haven't been met? These are future deadlines, right? You're, you're asking for advanced permission to not have to follow the Constitution. That's pretty unique as far as I've seen. That's not the Ferency case at all. That was something that happened after the fact. This is, now you're coming to us in advance looking for a get out of jail free card. That's, that's pretty unique in Michigan's history as far as I can see. Yes, Your Honor, and I would say that the, the language the controversy? of section, and I would say that the section of six, the section six nineteen allows for and in fact ha contemplates that anticipatory role here. I see that my time is up, and I don't what, want what to. What language are you referring me to in section six nineteen? I'm that referring contemplates to, the anticipatory role that we would play because it is rather striking, a rather striking assertion. It contemplates an uh, anticipatory role with respect to a timing requirement because it says that this court should direct the commission and the secretary to perform their respective duties. And it would make no sense for this court to direct the petitioners to comply with the duty they've already missed. And that aspect of this court's jurisdiction was broadened by the people when they left out the requirement, when they took out the requirement that an elector had to bring this, and when they wrote the language that they wrote. Uh, I, I am conscious of the time that my colleagues have. Uh, yeah, but we're gonna keep asking you a few questions <laughs> if we have them. Why, why do you need this court to change this constitutional deadline at all? I mean, it seems to me if you just skip the deadline, then there's going to be a lawsuit filed saying they didn't do their job, direct them to do their job. But you're coming into court before the deadlines even come upon us, asking us to essentially ignore what's written in our Constitution. Why do you, why do you need this? Well, first of all, because the Constitution allows for it, so, and secondly, because practically speaking, it makes, a, uh, it makes sense. It doesn't make sense to wait and then have a challenge. The, the very maps themselves could be challenged if they are drawn after the November 1st deadline. And all that does is create a challenge while the commission is still trying to uh, but, to finish what kind its work. of challenge would that create when the only authority we have as a court is to direct you to do your work? But the, but the dilemma here, Your Honor, and it's a dilemma that's important to the questions the court has asked, is that the, the, you have a mandate to direct these petitioners to perform their respective duties. They're in a situation where they cannot perform all of the constitutional duties that uh, Section 6 mandates. And under that circumstance... Well, can't, can't they perform this duty if they go to a, a vendor who's offering services that are claimed to be 
very close or as good to what the government's going to provide you anyhow? Ms. Paschal is probably in the best situation to, right, to talk to, to the commission, but I would say that this court should defer to what the petitioners have said is, is the work that they can or cannot complete. They are the ones that are experienced at doing this work. Isn't that the problem with not having adverse parties? We have to take one side's word for it. We don't have a factual record. We don't have opposing viewpoints, sharpening the, the facts, factual record, or the legal issues. Isn't, isn't that the whole part the problem with having people come into court? by agreement again this keeps happening to us asking us to go along with your agreement i mean we're, we're, we're in a different branch of government it's not our job to 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 give this kind of advice on, on future conduct how to, how to how to conduct yourself in the future it's a very strange request and i guess the the problem i have is you keep saying that it's we're supposed to tell you to perform your duties when what you're asking us to do is to tell you that you don't have to perform your duties as they're clearly stated in the Constitution. That's a very strange request. Actually, when, when all the duties can't be performed, what the petitioners are asking is that this court direct them to tell them which duties must be performed, and that is encompassed within the language of Section 619. Uh, thank you, Your Honors. Nice escape, Ms. Sherman. <laughs> Good morning, my name is Julianne Pastula on behalf of Petitioners the Commission. Why are we here? For transparency and goodwill. Petitioners want to honor and be faithful to what the people have outlined and seek this court's guidance and interpretation of the Constitution. This is a historic undertaking by the inaugural commission formed through a voter-led initiative to shift redistricting from the partisan legislature to an independent commission to eliminate the abuses caused by partisan gerrymandering. The theme of Article 4, Section 6 is that this is a deliberative, transparent process for the drafting of redistricting plans that are designed to facilitate and integrate public participation. Both the public and the commission have been put in an untenable position due to the intersection of timing, data, and process issues. First as to timing. September 17th is the operative deadline. This begins the 45-day public comment period required prior to a vote on November 1st. Like clockwork, PL data used for redistricting has been released every census cycle by April 1st, except this year. There is a six-month delay by September 30th as the data is expected to be relieved. This is unprecedented, and it will make publication by seven, September 17th an impossibility. Untabulated legacy format data is expected August 16th. This data is unusable until processed, which is expected to be done by our consultants by August 26th. However, it cannot fill the constitutional standard in subsection 9 absent reconciliation with the PL data released on September 30th. This issue is twofold. First, we do not know if the legacy data is accurate, and we cannot know that until the PL data is released September 30th. Secondly, and even more importantly, even if we knew the legacy data was accurate and reliable, or let's say the PL data were somehow released on August 16th, that would provide a mere 22 days for both the commission and the people to undertake their work. This is un insufficient time because in 22 days, the commission would have to, in open meetings, draw 161 districts that comport with seven clearly ranked criteria in the Michigan Constitution, consider and integrate the public's ample input and their proposed plans, they're submitting maps to us as well, utilize results of statistical analysis by our consultants, which include racial block voting and compliance with the Voting Rights Act, and hold five public hearings throughout the state of Michigan through, with, to receive feedback, pardon me, on those proposed plans. So even if the commission could accomplish all of those things in 22 days, it could not honor the public's part constitutional right to participate in the process in those same 22 days. Council, let me, let me interrupt you, but, but 
I, I, I appreciate the, the um, transparency and the um, request for direction, but what it, the, the Constitution says that nobody other than the Commission can draw the maps, and it has no penalty for non-compliance. So what if the Commission just t does it as soon as it can, but it doesn't meet the deadline? What, what, what would be the penalty? What, what are you worried about? The petitioners are before this court re requesting a one-time narrow adjustment and suspension no, to I enable it. No, I understand what you're asking for, mm -hmm. but I'm just wondering why you need it right now. Like, what's the? What are you worried about if we don't pre give you give you guidance in advance? Petitioners are very concerned that with trying to perform all their duties in that 22 days, that the process will not be honored, the process will be at issue. So come September 18th, it will be a challenge not only to the timing of maps, but theoretically align the petitioners where they could be uh, subject to and even a challenge as to the sufficiency of maps. So the, the again, the one-time remedy would allow the petitioners the ability to conduct their work but, but even if that happens, at the end of the day, who draws the maps? The commission is the only body in the state of Michigan that can draw the maps. So what's your concern? That the abbreviated, the truncated time frame from six months to 22 days will, will prohibit the Again, commission. Again, if you don't do it in that time. Take longer. If you don't do it in that time, what happens? Someone will file a suit, and the only authority this court has is to tell you, do your work. Yes, but the, the key point is that the, is to, the substantive duties in the Constitution are the process by which the Commission must follow. And the enactors and the people also selected the November 1st deadline. But like in Forensi, it, it is a, a mechanism to move the process along, not to choose either or. And, and the question becomes whether the people intended on uh, September 17th, tied to November 1st, that there be no maps or that the, the maps would, the work, how, how the work would be engaged, I think is, is dispositive and, and would warrant relief. Ms. Paschula, um, if I could jump in. Um, we've heard some talk about um, w whether this is an advisory opinion or, and I'm just wondering what your thoughts are. Is, are do, if we, assuming we can jump in at this stage, is this an advisory opinion or is this something different that's in our constitution now? This would be something different than advisory petition. This would be under section 619. This would be, again, a, a very, only in the redistricting context. So every 10 years, uh, in the redistricting context to direct the petitioners how to perform their duties. And their other uh, courts have, uh, have provided relief in the same fashion that are, is requested here. Uh, in Padilla, in California, their court provided a one-time adjustment so that the process could operate as intended by the voters. The California Supreme Court held it was clear the enactors would have preferred the deadline to be adjusted than the opportunity for public comment to be preserved. So by the commission um, expediting its work, which it has every intention of doing, that these, the trying to meet the September 17th deadline versus the reasonable uh, deadline of December 11th for publication, that 72 days is critical, it's meaningful, and it would have a huge impact on the manner in which the, the commission undertakes its work and allows the public to be a, a part of that work as intended. If we grant relief in this case, you were saying this is once in every 10 years. Is it, so basically every 10 years we'll be asked to set forth a scheduling order that sort of ignores the constitutional deadlines based on the conditions on the ground and the convenience of the parties and so forth. It seems to me if, if that's what the voters wanted and that's what they would have voted for, right? The, the, the voters, the electors could have said the court shall set the schedule or some other body or the commission or somebody else, but instead they put the dates in the Constitution itself. You, you, you guys keep referring to this as a one-time deal. Well, we don't do one-time deals. Our one-time deals go into these, these neat little books and people pull them out from time to time and they say, you did this for them and we want you to do that now and do it for us. So it, how is it, how, isn't this going to then, then be the model going forward? We're going to be dragged into this? every cycle to set forth the schedule here and maybe another constitutionally prescribed 
uh, timing schedules as well if we start to do this for you? This is a rare and extreme circumstance. Again, the census data has never been delayed in this fashion. This is unprecedented. So when the people enacted this constitutional amendment, there was no way that they could foresee this would ever happen. The census data is, is uh, t timely. It's, it's always released by April 1st. So this whole structure uh, is dependent upon that, and it begs the question of what is more important, November 1st or the work to be undertaken? And, and that is the question. It's also distinguishable from the Ohio case. The Ohio case, uh, the petitioners had indicated that they can complete their work by the, using legacy data. Well, per Ohio's deadline, they'll have three months to do this, to do their work, to undertake their work. They have a political commission of seven individuals that only are required to have three public hearings. These are drastically different processes than what Michigan is facing. And the commission has, has every intent to fulfill its duties and give life to the amendment by bringing in the public. In 22 days is simply insuff insufficient to do so. And so the reasonable request for the 72 day extension would allow that, that work to occur in tandem. And I see my time is running out as well. If there are no questions, further questions, I'll sit. Thank you very much. Can give her two minutes. Good morning, Assistant Attorney General Heather Meingas on behalf of Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson. Secretary Benson agrees with the arguments made by Ms. Sherman and Ms. Pastula as to this court's authority to exercise jurisdiction in this matter to deem the constitutional deadline directory and that under the unprecedented circumstances facing the commission due to the delay in census data, that the extraordinary relief requested here is certainly warranted under the circumstances. The secretary is impacted by the delay really in two respects. First, under the constitution, the secretary- You know can, what, sorry. the total time is is, is up, so let me just ask some Sure, questions. go ahead. Why, why don't you just utilize the services of a vendor that uh, pick out the best vendor you can and live up to the de deadlines in the Constitution as opposed to coming to this court and asking us to change the deadlines in the Constitution? Well, Your Honor, we don't need a vendor. The Commission has hired its own expert technical services, and that those that expert is prepared to process the data, the legacy data for the commission. So we've already taken care of that piece. The commission is prepared to take the legacy data and have a vendor put that into a tabulated format for the use of the commission. That's how the commission is even going to get started with the data. And so that tabulation process, we are going to tabulate it ourselves so that we can start the process. We're going to get the data on the 16th. It's going to take about seven to 10 days for the, our expert to tabulate that data. And then the commission can get started drawing maps using that legacy format data. Mm -hmm. So we don't need a vendor. We have our own vendor. We're prepared to go forward. But as Ms. Pastula explained, once we've got our data, once we've got it tabulated for our use, that's August 26th. And then we have about 22 days. The commission has about 22 days okay. to complete I, I, all the tasks. I understand where you're going. Sure. Why do you need us? Just, Why do we need yeah, you? Just ignore it. I mean, there's, to me, there's not a controversy here. Everybody seems to be in agreement. The controversy will be when you skip the date, mm. at which time then there will be a lawsuit filed, and people will come to the court, and they'll say they missed the date. Tell them to do their work. And now we've got a real con controversy, and we can tell you to do your work. But right now you're asking us to just give you a pass before there's any real controversy. Well, respectfully, I disagree, Your Honor. I believe that there is a controversy right now. We know, the Secretary and the Commission know right now, today, that we cannot honor the constitutional time frame. We cannot honor the deadlines, and we cannot honor the public comment period, the public input that the people placed in the Constitution that's driven, that drove this initiative. We know right here standing today that we can't meet our deadlines. That is a controversy. We have a legal conflict. We have an impossibility facing us right now. And there are consequences. What are they? This court has, the, under 619, this court has the ability to direct us in the performance of its duties, and this court has the ability to hear challenges to the plan. What we're concerned about is somebody coming in on November 15th 
and or under our timeline, if we're not done until December 11th or in adopting plans in January, a challenge comes, review this plans, they are unconstitutional because they are untimely. And, and How can we fix that, that, that Your Honor? do then is what? I'm sorry? The only thing that this, even if, even if that argument is made, what can this court do about that? I'm not Simply send it back to the commission and tell them to do their work. You want us to go back and draw plans timely that we can't do. I mean, that would be the result of your direction. We can't, we can no longer draw it would timely be, it would plans. Be, it would be ludicrous for this court to say, go draw plans two months ago. Once you skip the date, and other plans are in and people are saying the lines that are drawn are unconstitutional, take my plan. Can this court say, yeah, we're gonna take that plan under the constitution as it's written? You couldn't take a plan from another party, only exactly. the commission Exactly, the only the plan plans. that can be taken comes from the commission. The only authority this court has is to tell the commission to do their work. And if we find a problem with the work that's been done, we say go back and do it over. Isn't that the way the constitution is written under this latest amendment? I'm not entirely sure that your jurisdiction or your ability is so limited. You have the ability to review challenges that's to That's not answering my question, though. I am trying to you're answer your me, question, You're telling sir. me, just give us the relief we want now. What we're trying to pr protect against are challenges to the plans that we cannot fix. We cannot fix that our plans were going to be drawn untimely. What happens then is if, if, the, if, the, deadline, if the deadline is mandatory and we miss the plan, is that a basis for striking the validity of the plans? We can't go back and draw timely plans. And, in, and if that's the case, are there just no plans? We've come before the court seeking to be proactive and upfront and transparent about the troubles that we're facing. This court has the jurisdiction under 619 to help guide us, to instruct us as to whether that constitutional timeline must be met or whether we can follow an alternative plan that allows us to accomplish our mission with the input of the public and draw plans as the people expected us to do. Council, can I, uh, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I just want to ask a question because I, I think Justice Sarah's question is a good one. First, I have to say, isn't it wonderful that we're all back in person? I don't think I've ever felt so good in my life that we're all here in person. It is the greatest feeling ever. Anyways, um, the question I have is just to kind of get into the more logistics of it, what, what, explain to the court what would happen if the court doesn't give you guidance? Explain to us in a more logistical, on the ground impact as to if you don't get the remedy that you're seeking, what would ultimately happen? What would the real life implications actually be? Well, I think if the court does not grant the relief that we've requested, um, the plan of the commission and the secretary is to perform exactly under the time frame that we've outlined to this court. So we will not meet the deadline. We will do our, our best, as we've already articulated, to, to perform the work timely, but that's not going to happen. And we're going to pursue or exceed, proceed under the timeline that we've suggested to the court. So that's the logistics. We're going to go ahead. We're going to do everything that the Constitution requires of the commission and the secretary um, to draw plans, but they are not going to be timely plans. And what would the implication of that be? What would the effect of it be on people, on voting, on all of this? Well, I think that's, that echoes um, Justice Sara's question, and what's the impact of having an untimely plan? The question is we don't know because we haven't faced the situation I... before. What we're concerned about is having challengers come to court, whether it's in November or December in January, mm -hmm. and asking this court to strike plans because they are unconstitutional because we missed the deadline. And so what we don't know is what the answer the court would provide at that time. And if the court's, the court's advice at that time, wait, well, no, you had to meet that deadline, that's an impossibility. So we're trying to come, we're trying to be pro proactive and preemptive to get the commission off to the best footing that it can and the people themselves so that we can have constitutionally drawn plans with input from the public that's so important to this process. Council, if we decide we have the authority to give you some direction, is there a time by which the commission or the secretary believes you need that direction? Well, in our motion to expedite the proceedings, we suggested that relief by, you know, an order from this court by August 1st would be helpful. Um, you know, I would think anything before probably getting the legacy data on August 16th, hopefully, under the current Census Bureau's plans, would um, guide us going forward. In other words, we would need to know, are we going to be required, I mean, do we need to do everything possible or should we need to draw plans in 22 days? Is that what the court expects? that we should draw plans and have them adopted by November 1st, 
despite having this extremely truncated time period. Thank you. Um, I, with the court's leniency, we would like to have a minute or two for rebuttal. You can consider that. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see how this all goes. <laughs> I'm just enjoying the in-person, so I'm inclined to do it just because I love that we're all here. I'm loving, apparently, I can't get over how nice this is. <laughs> I didn't think I was gonna have to move it, but unfortunately I do. Good morning and may it please the court. Assistant Attorney General Kyla Barranco on behalf of the Attorney General opposition team. Petitioners seek relief that this court has neither the jurisdiction nor the authority to grant. And while they no doubt come to this court in good faith, the relief they seek is extraordinary. A one-time revision of Article 4, Section 6-7, which states in no uncertain terms that not later than November 1st, the commission shall adopt a redistricting plan. The common understanding of this phrase needs no parsing. The people intended, in fact, they deliberately chose, a mandatory date certain by which, the by which the commission must complete its constitutional duties. However, even if this court has jurisdiction and the authority to deem a clear, unequivocal, constitutional timing provision directory, this case does not present the most extreme circumstances necessary to warrant a departure from clear, unequivocal constitutional language. And for those reasons, I ask that this court deny the petition, and to the extent I have free fire time in this unique posture, I, I do waive it at this point. Moving to Article 4, Section 619, Your Honors, there's no need to complicate that provision's language. Direct to perform their respective duties means just that. This court can direct the commission to perform the duties prescribed in Article 4, Section 6. Petitioners try to add words to this provision. For example, I just heard attorney for the Secretary of State say direct in the performance of the, their duties. But that's simply not what the provision says. And, and that's important that the, this court abide by the dictates of Section 619. And that's because this court is limited to exercising only the judicial power. And 619 does not change that. The court has long taken the stance that it doesn't decide abstract questions or uh, cases that lack an actual controversy or cases that simply seek guidance for future litigants. The, li the judicial power limits this court to deciding genuine controversies and there simply isn't one here. Your Honors, the history of Article 4, Section 6 also supports a more narrow interpretation. In adopting Proposal 18.2, the drafters used essentially nearly verbatim provisions um, in a number of ways. For example, former Constitution 1963, Article 4, Section 6, Paragraph 8, stated that this court, in the exercise of original jurisdiction, shall direct the Secretary of State or the Commission to perform their duties. The drafters of Proposal 18.2 decided to use the same language here. Now, interestingly, the convention comment in 1963 stated, upon application of any elector, the Supreme Court may compel the performance of duties imposed in this section. Here, what petitioners are asking this court to do is not to impose the duties uh, in the section, but to change those duties, duties or otherwise to excuse them. And again, this court doesn't have the power to do so. As to Article 6, Section 4, Your Honors, this, this provision also does not provide a, a jurisdictional grant. Uh, the prefatory clause here must mean something, and to hold that mandamus can lie in any redistricting case would essentially um, cause 619 to be mere surplusage. Additionally, Your Honors, I don't think that the this court's mandamus power is as broad as petitioners suggest. For example, the separation uh, of let me, powers... Let me just ask, what, what would happen if they just missed the date? Your Honor, if they miss the date, um, for example, we'll say September 17th. If September 17th comes around and there are, are no proposed plans, then someone, uh, either a litigant, perhaps the Secretary of State, can file an action in this court to direct them to comply with their constitutional duties, which would be to adopt a redistricting plan. And at that point, this court wouldn't be changing or altering any duties. This court would essentially be doing the one thing it can do, and that is to compel them to 
complete the only existing constitutional duty, which again is to adopt that redistricting plan. Is, is it your position that we could direct them to come up with a plan in a week or a day? Your Honor, there is some history for this court uh, having discretion in how long a commission has. So for example, in um, 1965, in one of the many apportionment cases, the commission at that time, before it had been invalidated, actually missed its deadline, um, didn't perform its duties for a number of reasons. And this court said under Article 4, Section 6, Paragraph 18, shall direct, we're going to direct you to do your duties. The duty is that you must adopt a redistricting plans, and we're going to give you 60 days to do it, and we'll retain jurisdiction. And if you don't do so, then we'll hold you in contempt of court. Now, of course, Justice Black wasn't able to get his majority opinion, but he did get a memorandum opinion that said that under Article 4, Section 6, that is exactly the court's power, is to compel them to do their duties, nothing more than that. Counsel, I, I have a question. I just, I love, I'm just, this is the best proceeding I've been to. I'm just so happy that we're together. Um, but, but, the, but the question that I, but the, but the best question, the question I'm gonna ask you though, is really this, is they're already telling you that they're not gonna be able to perform. So I guess the question back to you is if they're already telling you they can't meet this, that they can't do it, I mean, doesn't it turn out to be a situation where they get in trouble either way? That they're saying they can't do it, then if they can't do it, you're gonna say, oh, you should have been able to do it. Well, Your Honor, I don't start with, I think it's problematic that they're saying they can't do it based on the language in their own petition. For example, it says in the, the petition, the data in the legacy format files is identical to the PL94171 redistricting files. It is subject to the same exacting quality assurance processes. The only difference is one is tabulated and one is not. And to put that into kind of a practical um, consideration for you, one is going to come in a zip file as explained by the US Census Bureau. And another is gonna come in what petitioners have described as a user-friendly format. So essentially, a DVD that comes delivered to you, you put it on your computer and you open it up and essentially it's like a software program that has drop downs you could filter. So really, you know, to the extent there is a difference between the two of them, it is that one is user-friendly and one is not. Now, they, of course, they have a technical expert that can process this data. They've admitted that's the case. So really it comes down to what is the risk in processing that data? And the risk is very small and really no one's been able to uh, explain what that risk is other than there is this risk. But at the end of the day, like I said, EDS is familiar with this data. It's used it in the past. Actually, this data was released to all of the states in, after the 2000 census, also after the 2010 census. So this isn't new data. So really. The fact that the commission is saying that they can't do that, that has yet to be seen. Once they receive this legacy data, there is a chance that they'll be able to use it. And, you know, again, getting back to what's going to happen, say, on September 17th, that they can't do their duty. Well, the Constitution, in a way, contemplates this. There's two stop gaps for if the commission doesn't do its duties correctly or maybe even timely. One is that the commission, you know, shall propose plans on September 17th. Now, what is the purpose of proposing those plans if not to correct, say, any errors or uh, make additions or changes? Because if the public is truly to give their input on these plans, it would seem odd that the commission could listen to that and then not incorporate it in their final plans on November 1st. Now, come November 1st, say we have a plan, or maybe we don't have a plan, but say we have a plan, and again, we think it's problematic. Well, the Constitution provides that someone can challenge that plan to this court, and if this court finds that the plan, the plan is invalid or otherwise deficient, it could remand it to them, and then they can go ahead and go forth and correct all their deficiencies. So really, there isn't any harm at this point in telling the commission, try your best uh, with the data that you might be able to use, and uh, come September 17th, maybe we'll have a different case and maybe we'll have an actual controversy. Council, um, I know, I think it's Illinois, I think there's litigation pending where using the legacy data is, there, there's a lawsuit by their legislature saying it's not good enough. Mm -hmm. So is that a valid concern by the commission that the legacy data maybe is, you know, obviously subject to litigation uh, and questionable? No, Your Honor, I don't think so. And again, it's, it's by their own very statements. The data itself is identical. Uh, the process that it's subject to, exactly the same. And again, what we're really dealing with is, is this legacy data is uh, 
and I'm, I'm, I apologize, I'm not a, a tech wizard, but it's essentially you know, all of the, the data that is part of those DVDs. It's just when those DVDs get delivered on, delivered on September 30th, they're again in, in user-friendly format. So by petitioner's own statements, I don't think that's a concern that uh, should be given any great weight by this court. What about the issue that even with the legacy data, they only have about 22 days to meet their deadline? Well, Your Honor, that, that, surely, that surely is um, not preferred, but preference is not impossibility. And case law in this state had said, has said that when we're going to excuse a constitutional provision, and I, I use that word excuse, I, I can't think of another word for it, but we're going to use it, it has to be impossible. And what they're saying right now is not that it's impossible, but that we would prefer to use the PL 94171 data. We're not, we don't have it, although none of us are fortune tellers, unfortunately, so arguably the census data could be released early and they could have time. But again, the case law says that it has to be impossible and not merely we would prefer to have something else. So, Council, what's the harm to you? You, you've emphasized, you know, intensively that, you know, there's no harm to them. But what's so? Why are you so concerned about this? What is, what is the specific harm that you're here, and why is this so critical? Well, I think there's a number of harms. First, that the people intended uh, this deadline, and it's the people's will in adopting it. And I think that's made very evident by the fact that prior to Proposal 18-2, there actually was a more fluid deadline. It was of 180 days after receiving census data. The people moved away from that, and they said, we're going to set a, a date certain, essentially, November 1st. And so I think it's important to give effect to the people's intent. But second, I think that this court's judicial power in granting the relief that petitioners seek is also compromised. Article 6, Section 1, was amended in, in a way to say that except to the extent limited or abrogated by Article 4, Section 6, limited and abrogated do not mean expanded. And if this court grants the relief that petitioners seek under Article 4, Section 619, that will be exactly what this court is doing, is expanding this court's judicial power. But, but if you look at the case law, though, I mean, it does, I mean, if you look at some of the, the, the history of this and the case law that we're citing to, it does allow for significant catastrophic events that, you know, ultimately allow for some guidance and some leniency here. I mean, if COVID isn't considered to be a significant event, what would you consider to be a significant event? Well, COVID is, is certainly a significant event, and I will not. We haven't been in this building for 18 months. So, I mean, we haven't been in this building for eight, just think about that. So, so that's why I'm so excited this morning. So it's like the first day of school. So, so, and I keep going. It back is my first day of school. I, <laughs> but the thing is, there, but, but you know, as excited as I am that we're here in person, there is some significance to it, right? I don't know too many other historical events where people haven't been in their offices for 18 months. So, I'm going to go back to you. What if this wouldn't be considered to be a significant interlying intervening event? Tell me what would be. Your Honor, I have no doubt, and, and I don't dispute that COVID-19 certainly upended all of our lives, including the U.S. Census Bureau's. However, the case law is clear. If we are going to have one of those rare, unique, to use the phraseology in, in Ferency, circumstances by which we excuse a constitutional deadline, you have to look at two things. First, is it impossible? And to be quite frank, in, in Ferency and Kuhn, which is the other case that they distinguished from, both of the deadlines had actually passed in that case. So it truly was impossible, and that's not the situation we have here. Second, we also look to the nature of the provision. So for example, in Ferency, the court held that the deadline did not relate to the sufficiency or validity of the petitions themselves, and instead they were designed to give the Secretary of State and clerks enough time to print and distribute ballots. The November 1st deadline Th that is very distinguishable from the deadline in Ferency. The deadline on November 1st kicks off a number of very important deadlines and really does relate to the sufficiency and validity of the election because ultimately if these plans aren't adopted, we can't have uh, a constitutionally valid election that complies with the Voting Rights Act, the federal constitution, but if and the But if you're so concerned about the sufficiency and validity of the election, don't you want to make sure that we get it right? I mean, why can't we just get this right? And what they're telling you is, Let's just get this right. Why can't we just do that? Like every now and then, can't we just do something that makes sense and get it right? And, and make sure that we have an appropriate accounting so we understand the census, so we understand the implications, and that we just really get this one right. And why can't we just, 
use what is necessary, the tools at our disposal in a timely fashion, considering the fact that we're going through a pandemic event, considering the fact this building was closed for 18 months, why can't we just get this one right? Well, Your Honor, uh, to start, I would disagree. We can get this right under the deadlines imposed for, for all the reasons I've already said and for really for the reasons that- Isn't the that question about who gets to get it right? Was it the people when they adopted this amendment? Did they get it right or they got it wrong and we're gonna get it right? And then we're not a democracy anymore, right? We're not, the people don't govern anymore. We don't care what they say because we're wiser and we're gonna get it right. So we'll just rewrite the constitution a little bit here and a little bit over there until we get it just right. This august body will take over for the people because they, it's about who gets it right. Who gets to say, right? Do we, gets to, do we get to make the determination or do the people of the state of Michigan who voted for this amendment that this court allowed to go on the ballot? A couple of years ago your honor I, b I believe it's the people and of course there is certain stop gaps built into the Constitution or I shouldn't say in the Constitution but case law itself that say in certain times it might be impossible to comply with the people's will but until those times are reached which I submit have not been reached here we have to abide by the people's intent and the people's intent is clear they have to adopt through districting plans by November 1st. And until it's shown that they cannot do so, it's impossible to do so, this court should not direct them to do otherwise, and this court also doesn't have authority to direct them to do otherwise. And for those reasons, I would ask this court to deny the petition unless there are any other questions. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honors. John Bursch on behalf of the Michigan Senate. Uh, Justice Bernstein, like you, I am delighted to be here in person. <laughs> and I have to say, I always enjoy having you come. Thank you, Justice. It's always nice to see you. Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court. I wanna begin with the point that Justice Viviano raised early on and that several other of you have noted, which is that petitioners are asking for an advisory opinion. Uh, what is an advisory opinion? It's an opinion issued on a matter that does not involve a justiciable case or controversy between adverse parties. That's this case. And this court's precedent in the adopt and amend legislation involving 2018 PA 368 and 369 should control here. Uh, the two justice lead opinion in that case emphasized that this court's judicial power is the right to determine actual controversies between adverse litigants. Any other proceeding is beyond the judicial power. Concluding that Article 3, Section 8 did not authorize this court to issue advisory opinions after an enactment's effective date, the opinion said this court lacked jurisdiction to proceed. The two justice concurring opinion agreed that this court rarely issues advisory opinions because such proceedings lack adverse parties who have an actual stake in the outcome. And they agreed the court should wait for an actual case or controversy. And there were three dissenters in that case who believed the court had the power to issue an advisory opinion after the enactment's effective date, but they did not disagree about those fundamental jurisdictional principles. So what does that mean here? Well, it's controlling. Like the legislature in the adopt and amend case, the commission and the secretary come to this court asking for an advisory opinion. Like the adopt and amend case, there is no case or controversy here. Like the adopt and amend case, there is no adverse parties here. And even though the attorney general admirably briefed both sides of the case here, just like it did in the adopt and amend case, this court lacks jurisdiction. So unless this court is willing to walk away from the opinions that it issued just uh, two years ago in 2019, there's nothing for the court to do other than to dismiss this case. And as we've heard this morning, that's appropriate because uh, this case is as unright as it could possibly be. If they're getting legacy data, which is identical in all substantive respects to the PL data by August 16th, and then they can process that in seven to 10 days as the commission has represented, they have 22 days to punch that data into a computer and pick among the myriad plans that are going to be generated from that. And I think key to that is what the commission's own voting rights attorney expert, Mr. Adelson, explained uh, just a few weeks ago, that if the tabulated data, that's the PL data, is available by September 30th, we're good to go. 
So the best representation you have as to their ability to comply, coming from their expert, this is their vendor that, that you were talking about, Justice Zara, he said that they're good to go if they have the PL data by September 30th. He also said just last week on uh, June 15th at a meeting that they could get started on their redistricting analysis even without the legacy data, um, examining important things like majority minority districts using data that's already available to the public. So there's no need for this court to break its jurisdictional rules to solve a problem that doesn't even exist yet. Mr. So Justice Birch, Bernstein. Do you, do you agree that if the commission does not meet the deadlines that there's, there's really no consequence? Like if somebody could come to us on November 2nd and said they didn't meet their deadlines, we could direct them and we could give them however long we wanted to. Well, that, that is a consequence, and I would hope that this court would hold their feet to the fire if that happened, because here's the big harm. I mean, aside from this court rewriting the Constitution and expanding its jurisdiction unlawfully, those are pretty big harms. But, well, but the practical harm, Justice Kavanaugh, is that if you give them an extension and then another extension, another extension, then it doesn't give the citizens time to challenge plans that don't comply with the constitutional provisions. The reason that we have the deadlines that we do is to leave adequate time so this court can exercise its other role under section 619, which is to review a challenge to any plan adopted by the commission. So you agree there is an importance to trying to meet those deadlines. Absolutely. Right? So they're being practiced, this is the, the opposite of the adage of, you know, ask for permission rather than ask for forgiveness later, right? They're here asking for permission so they don't have to ask for forgiveness later. And, and if we knew that they didn't have to, or that they, they, they would have to ask for forgiveness later, you know, then maybe they have an argument, although it's still an advisory opinion and, and you don't have jurisdiction and all that. Well, but, but we don't know that that's the case. Okay. Their own expert says if they've got the, the legacy, or not the legacy, but the, the PL data by the 30th September, which they're supposed to have it by, they are good to go. Those are his words. Okay, back to the jurisdictional question. Um, is there any significance in your mind to the fact that um, Article 6, uh, it applies to the court's judicial power, and Article 4 is the legislative power. Or, I'm sorry, the opposite, right? Is there, is there a significance, you're saying, you know, we need case and controversy and adverse parties, except the constitutional provision doesn't give us that, that textual limitation. We would be incorporating sort of our judicial power gloss on article on, on section 19. Well, the, the last I checked, every constitutional provision that we have is subject to this court's case and controversy adverse party power, except for article three, section eight, which of course is the advisory opinion section. So as Justice Viviano suggested when we first got started, if the intent of section six sub 19 was to somehow abrogate that and expand this court's um, opinion jurisdiction, it's advisory opinion jurisdiction, then that would have had to have been disclosed to the people because it certainly doesn't appear anywhere on the face of this. It also would have had to have been disclosed to the people that Article 3, Section 8 was being abrogated in part and expanded. And if it didn't do that, then the whole scheme here is unconstitutional. And I don't think anyone thinks that's going to comport with what the people wanted. Um, so there, there's nothing in Article 4, Section 619 which suggests that the ordinary rules, the boundaries on this court's jurisdiction don't apply. In fact, if you look at the language when it talks about directing the Secretary of State, that certainly sounds like a mandamus action. Tell them what to do. They've got clear duties here. They don't have any discretion. They have to do those. It, it doesn't say that you can issue an advisory opinion, changing the date, changing their responsibilities, or, or rewriting anything else that happens to so be in the So you don't interpret the word direct to mean, or possibly to mean give direction? Um, it, it could, but give direction still sounds very much like the mandamus power. I contrast that with Article 3, Section 8, um, which is your advisory opinion authority, which says that either House of the Legislature or the Governor may request the opinion of the Supreme Court on important questions of law on solemn occasions. And that's exactly what they are doing here when they come to this court without an adverse party, without a controversy, and ask for your opinion as to whether the date that they have written in the Constitution should be modified ahead of time when their own expert says that they can still comply with it. Mm. Um, so, you know, when you start to walk away from the jurisdictional limits that you have and rewrite deadlines before before they need to be rewritten, 
then we're taking away the, the feet to the fire principle that the Constitution required of the commission because we want them to get it done as quickly as possible. Now, if they're a day or two late, is anybody going to complain about that? Almost certainly not. And if someone did, would this court quickly throw that case out of court? Certainly it would. Um, but we want them to come as close to that deadline as they possibly can by not changing their deadlines unless it's absolutely necessary, as my friend said, unless it's impossible, because we want to give the maximum amount of time that the people wanted to give in order for there to be challenges in case they go off the rails. And this truly is not a nonpartisan redistricting commission. We have great hope and, uh, and encouragement that they're going to be doing exactly what they're supposed to be. But the reality is, is that in other states, purported nonpartisan uh, redistricting commissions have not been all that nonpartisan. Um, in some cases, they've been more uh, partisan and created worse gerrymands than even one-sided legislatures and gubernatorial authorities. Um, I don't think our commission is going to do that. But if they would start going in that direction, there needs to be adequate time to challenge the plan. And you only get that by forcing them to comply with the deadlines or as close to them as possible that the people chose. Mr. Bush, if the commission hired you to represent them, because they wanted your advice about what to do. You know, they, they believe that they can't comply with all of the duties the Constitution um, wants. They can't both um, get the public input and meet the timing. And they came to you and said, what should we do? How can we best insulate us from a lawsuit after the fact? What would you tell them? Well, first I would say, I'm a lawyer, not the data expert. Your data expert, who also is an attorney, has said you can do this, and I would listen to him. Um, but, but secondarily, I would say, Let's do the very best job that we can. If we want to insulate this process from any after the fact challenge, it's to come as close to hitting that deadline as we can. We've got a sophisticated expert, we've got computer programs, and we've got 22 days. Let's get to work and try to meet that deadline. And if we're close, I think the, US, the Michigan Supreme Court is going to say, you did the best you could under the circumstances, and that's good enough. Now let's look at the substantive challenges that may come later on down the road. That's the advice that I would give them. And separately, if, the, if a commission member um, or the commission, it's the entire commission, went to the secretary and said, we want you to extend our timing because we can't meet it, and she says, no, I can't do that, I'm not doing it, can the commission sue the secretary, and then would we have a case or controversy? Um, that's an interesting we're question. We're just having fun hypotheticals. Yeah, th th this is a fun <laughs> hypothetical. <laughs> Justice Bernstein wants us to stick around. So. Um. <laughs> Uh, be because the secretary and the commission are essentially sharing duties under this constitutional framework, it's difficult to see how they could be adverse parties. Um, what about but, a but, but I'd have to think concerned about group that. of citizens who say, you know, we, we think we're going to get left out uh, unless you extend the deadline, and the secretary says, I can't do it. I, I went to my lawyer, John Birch, and he said, don't do it. I'm not going to do it. And so those citizens now sue the secretary. Would we then have a case or controversy? I, I think you could at least arguably have a case or controversy there. I'd want to see the complaint and all that. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Sure. But, 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 <laughs> Possibly. But, but what you don't have is a ripe case or controversy until after the deadline has passed. And we know as a matter of certainty that they can't meet it. Thank you. Thank you there may be other questions, so, so don't go. Yeah, so uh, Mr. Oh, Bush, yes. I have a quick question. Um, so we know under the prior version of Article 4, um, the, the format for redrawing lines obviously fell to the Legislative Commission, um, and they had 180 days from receiving the census data. Let's take a step backwards and assume we had a pandemic a few years ago or 10 years ago. Would they be using the legacy data or the full census data, the final data. Um, if they had the legacy data, I'm confident they would use it. I mean, I, again, as I told the Chief Justice, I'm no expert when it comes to the data that they use, but I take their expert at his word when he says that the legacy data is just as good as the non-legacy data. And so I don't know why anyone wouldn't use that if they had it available to them. And I think that's why he also says he's willing to use even non-legacy data, non-Census Bureau data, to start getting the commission to think about things like majority minority districts, which are going to be an important part of this process. And that's data that they have right now. There's uh, work that can be done even before they get the legacy data on August 16th. Hmm. Um, so I don't see any reason why you can't go forward. And then I guess you, you raise a good point on the reconciliation of those two things. We don't think there's going to be much work to do there either. But there's nothing in the Constitution that requires them to promulgate plans for the public to comment on using the final data. They can use the initial data, which everyone concedes should be as accurate as the final data, and they can reconcile that after the fact. It's not that the Constitution requires the final PL data to be promulgated with the plans. It simply requires that some census data be promulgated with the plans. Well, they're getting that census data on August 16th. Um, so just as the legislature would have, I'm, I'm sure they're going to do the same and use every data that they have available to them. Okay, thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very Thanks. much, Mr. Birch. Great to be oh, back. I don't, is there, are there any further questions? No. Okay. Thank you. Um, if we, if you have two minutes of uh, rebuttal, do you have one person to bat rebuttal? Yes. Thank you. We don't want our microphone to get infected. <laughs> I appreciate the, con the concern. <laughs> Julianne Pastula, back on behalf of the petitioners. It is critical to understand that the legacy data is just not a preference of the commission. It does not meet the standards set forth, the constitutional standards set forth in subsection 9. Further, it is not the same data. It is in a database format that our data expert, EDS, not our voting rights ex ex expert, Dr. Mr. Adelson, will, will enact with. There's linkages to multiple files that need to be interpreted and combined together in a software program they create in order to generate tables similar to the PL data. The questions regarding race, ethnicity, and voting age need to be cross-referenced, creating 288 columns of potential combination of answers. All of those variations need to be tied to a piece of geography, like your home address, mm. so that tallies can be made for every census block in Michigan. This is not a, a question of it's the same data. It's the same underlying census data, but the presentation is drastically different. Our data expert says it's impossible to meet the September 7th deadline with PL data because it's released December 30th. He also said it is highly unlikely, if not impossible, to meet the September 17th deadline with the legacy data released August 16th because it raises issues about the accuracy and veracity of the data without the reconciliation process, which is a programming uh, tool also used by our data expert, not our Voting Rights Act expert to cross check and verify all of those census data points so that the commission is certain, the public is certain, again, that the proper data is being used to draw these districts. Council, can you respond to uh, Mr. Birch's comment about the fact that, you know, it sounds like they're anticipating some challenges to the commission's recommendations. And I guess the question is that if, it, if more time is given to you, that it will create a situation where there's less time for people to challenge the recommendations. I respectfully disagree with that. Uh, what all the, this will provide the commission and the public with certainty as to the timing by the proposed deadline that the commission is asserting and the secretary of state is asserting that we can fulfill our duties in this time frame. Again, belying a, t a, a challenge as to timing. The challenge to sufficiency of our work is, is, it would always be appropriate, uh, particularly given if we only had 22 days to do it with data that has not been verified appropriately. So, so again, I think the real harm is to the public by being cut out of the process and the harm to the commission is not having the certainty or the direction by which to follow uh, whether that November 1st deadline is in fact mandatory or directory as, as the people seem to intend as a touch point to move the process forward when weighed against all the substantive duties set out in the process. And it is not as simple as typing data into a program and maps come out. We have a commission of 13 lay individuals who are going to engage in this highly sophisticated and complex work with the assistance of consultants, but they have to analyze the criteria, the communities of interest criteria, it, the human element is a critical piece of this. The human element on the commission side and the human element on the public side. It cannot be supplanted or replaced simply by technology. Thank you. Can, can you um, think about um, this? What is the harm if we follow what's written in the Constitution and we, say, and we, and we don't give you relief here? And you do your best, and, and then under 19, someone challenges it. And it comes to us, and we say, yeah, they, you know, they didn't have uh, the, the data that they should have had, um, but they did everything else that, that they were supposed to know. Just go back and fix that. Where's the, where's the harm there? It doesn't seem like there would be that much delay if on November 2nd or 3rd, someone challenged that and, and brought it to us. So I think we would look at it and say, you know, they, they didn't have, uh, you know, they, they based it on legacy data, then they 
Then they got the PL data, and then they had hearings, and they tried to adjust it, but they didn't quite get there by the deadline. But they met the deadline, and and we, we know that there's more work to be done. And, and then we send it back. Where's the harm in that? I think the harm there is certainly the, the risk and the uncertainty uh, to assume that the court would take that posture at that future time. Uh, we're here now identifying these issues before the court because of the extreme circumstances caused by the census delay and the pandemic. And similar to Ferency, where this court did a one-time adjustment of a constitutional deadline, finding that the underlying petition in that case was more uh, substantive, the substantive work and needed to be adhered to as opposed to just the, the point in time could be uh, found directory. So again, to, to say, that the commission would undertake, it, undertake its work, we can't presume to adopt uh, our proposed schedule and, and say, oh, the court will just be fine with it. We're asking for direction from the court, saying that this is reasonable relief. It is a reasonable time frame by which to undertake the process and give life to Proposal 18-2 in this inaugural cycle, as opposed to the uncertainty of not knowing whether there would be uh, a successful challenge as to timing after November 1st. But that and sounds to me like what you're asking for is an advisory opinion from this court. Well, it is not a, uh, advisory. I would, I would respectfully disagree. It would not be an advisory opinion because we intend to comply with it. It's not, it, it, it is something that would give us direction in our duties. It would give a certainty in, in our duties in the time in which we would be compelled to do them, given the unprecedented circumstances. And again, another point in fairness that uh, it, it wasn't just that the de deadline passed as the AG's team in opposition stated, it was that it was through no fault of the petitioners. We find ourselves in the same place. The November 1st deadline does not re relate to the sufficiency of our work, but it could preclude uh, preclude the, the fullness and the adoption of our work uh, on, a successful ch on a successful challenge in the future, potentially. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. The case will be submitted. Thank you all.